Today is Sunday, December 18th, <clears throat> 2022. Uh, the topic for my Teisho today is Zen and religion. Um, I, I got to thinking about this as a topic, um, both sort of uh, thinking about looking at the transition that people make from the workshop uh, to practicing here at the center. And uh, when, we, when we give the workshop, we're not talking about any of the, or not talking much about any of the devotional aspects of uh, Zen practice. We're really cutting to the heart of, of Zen, of, of dropping ideas and concepts. And I always kind of feel concerned about people making that transition, coming in here and all of a sudden <clears throat> um, we're doing prostrations and chanting and uh, stuff about returning merit. And I, I think it can be a little bit of a barrier to entry. And uh, I know for me, when I first came to the center, uh, I was quite excited about Zen, but all the other aspects just seemed like annoyances <clears throat> to me. Um, that probably has to do with the kind of <clears throat> person I am. Not necessarily the greatest, but um, the other the other reason this sort of came up is because uh, we're going into the are we in we're in the middle of the Christmas season, <clears throat> and there's part of that season which is actually pretty wonderful. Uh, it's not the not the part that has to do with buying everybody the right present and uh, <clears throat> going to office parties. But there is, there is, I just remember as a child being so taken with um, the whole idea of goodwill, goodwill to men. And, uh, and uh, maybe there was more, more of that in the airwaves uh, when I was a kid than there is today. Today it's pretty commercialized. Some people <clears throat> uh, actually... Uh, call it the war on Christmas, all the commercialization. I read a great thing, and it's this. The war on Christmas cannot end until Christmas stops its illegal occupation of November. <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> Zen practice, Zen Buddhism, arose from within Buddhism. Um, but we teach, Roshi, Kaplow, Bowden Roshi, all of us have always taught that it can be practiced by followers of any religion or followers of no religion. So we have the whole question, is, is Zen a religion? And people have different answers. So I want to go first to somebody in our line, uh, Yamada Roshi, You've read the Three Pillars of Zen. Uh, you've read, if you read it, you've read his Enlightenment account. Uh, it's it's quite remarkable. He uh, he already had met uh, Philip Kaplow there in Japan, and <clears throat> um, I think part of perhaps the trigger for his uh, Kensho was uh, Roshi Kaplow's total obsession with the idea of coming to awakening. And uh, I remember in the, in the book, he says, tell him, tell him it's totally worth it. Can't remember exactly how he put it, but uh, yeah, it's a pretty moving account. Anyway, uh, he later became a teacher and in fact, the, uh, the head of the Sambo uh, line of Zen, which is the line starting with Harada Roshi and through Yasutani Roshi, <clears throat> and then the next successor was Yamada, Yamada Roshi. So I found an article um, entitled, Is Zen a Religion? And uh, here's his answer. Zen is not a religion. This is a position I have continuously maintained. 
To say that Zen is not a religion is to say that the Buddha way is not a religion. However, religious concepts invariably are intertwined with such words as Zen or the Buddha way. Most people have no problem with the statement that Zen is not a religion, but I think that there are many who have some trouble with the statement that the Buddha way is not a religion. Of course, by the Buddha way, you could also say Buddhism. <clears throat> Probably Buddha way is a better way of putting it, the Buddha Tao. Why is Zen not a religion? Why is the Buddha way not a religion? Well, he <clears throat> goes into the question of what a religion is, and he says, I will use the definition, uh, a definition, which seems to be representative, representative. This is from something called the Kojian. I have no idea what that is. But the definition is this. Religion means activities and faith in a god or some kind of sacred being, which is differentiated from other worldly beings. And it also refers to those related structures. <clears throat> In other words, Yamada says, fundamental to establishing religion is to recognize a being that transcends the power of nature and of human beings. And from that, one can say that religion involves faith in that transcendent being and activities based on that faith. But then what is Zen? As I am always saying, Zen is experientially finding one's true self and the effort to personalize that true self which was found. <clears throat> I think the, another way of putting personalize that true self is to integrate uh, into one's life what one has seen. <clears throat> he says, put very simply, Zen is the pursuit and clarification of one's true self. It is no exaggeration to say that that is Zen in its entirety. The object of Zen is, in the final analysis, the self and nothing else except the self. <clears throat> it should be clear then that religion, which begins from recognition of a transcendent being that transcends the self and Zen, are totally different entities. He goes on to say, why is it that the terms Zen, Buddha, Buddha way are associated in common thinking with religion or a part of religion? I think it is because the true self which has been found, the real self, is so far separated from the illusory self which had been seen as the self up to then. And I think that's a, a, a good analysis. Uh, what we're, even though what we're looking for <clears throat> what uh, we're heading towards is something that's right here already. It's not, not in any way not here. What we believe about ordinary life, our delusion about our lives, uh, is such a different world than the true world, than our true self. <clears throat> It's easy to see those two as separate. It's one of the real challenges of Zen practice, even after coming to awakening, to realize it isn't anything special. It's not anything that's somewhere else. It's not something that's waiting for us in the future. This true self that is no self is right here and right now. He says, the fact that the whole universe, all that is, and the self are exactly one and the same is something too far removed from what one had thought about the self up to then. For those who have not found the true self, and that is the greater part of all humanity, cannot conceive this experience in any other way than that of the self as some kind of completely transcendent being and thus this would enter the realm of religion. And then he goes on to say how that's been sort of uh, uh, strengthened by the 
tendency of those preaching Buddhism to look upon the Buddha as a transcendent being and to emphasize his uh, uh, sort of separate nature. There are a lot of schools of Buddhism where uh, they're much more sort of in the the line of, uh, of a theistic religion. He says, it can be said that to be free of religion means the switch from faith to the pursuit and discovery of the truth of existence and the process in which Zen and natural science ceaselessly come closer and closer. <clears throat> In that sense, the mission of the Sanbo Zen, that's his school, the school, is the de-religionizing of Zen. Then he quotes Kohen Roshi, who says, Christians who do Zazen can become better Christians. Muslims can become better Muslims. Well, <clears throat> I guess one could argue back that what uh, Yamada has done is set up a straw man that, uh, by defining religion as a belief in something transcending uh, the self, transcending reality <clears throat> um, we've sort of uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's clear that's not what Zen is but there are other ways of looking at religion uh, and if we say religion is the belief that there's something more than the limited way that we think about our lives, that there's something that can be discovered, that there's a reason to do the experiment of practice, then I have no problem with saying that Zen is a religion. And there are a lot of other uh, teachers and writers who have, who have said that. Uh, uh, G.U. Kennett, Roshi Kennett, um, Ruth Fuller Sasaki come to mind, both of whom <clears throat> wrote stuff uh, talking about Zen as a religion. And uh, even Yamada, even the, the school of Zen in which we're in, has all kinds of what most people would call religious elements. There's chanting. There are Buddha figures on the altar. People do prostrations. <clears throat> take the precepts. But I think in all of that, the important thing is to distinguish between dogma, between taking someone else's word for what reality is, what our true self is, and finding out for ourselves. It's really finding a way beyond words and concepts. And that's the, <clears throat> from the very beginning, that's the slogan of Zen Buddhism, going back to Bodhidharma. Many of you have heard these words, a special transmission beyond the scriptures or beyond the sutras. No dependency on words and letters, pointing directly to the human mind seeing into one's nature and attaining Buddhahood. <clears throat> Chorus for a teaching beyond words and letters, Zen has probably produced more writing than uh, any other school of Buddhism. <clears throat> and, and you have to, you have to, it's, it's pointing to the moon. Uh, we all need instruction, we all need a little bit of a roadmap. Uh, but the problem is, of course, mistaking the finger for the moon. It's a natural human error, which I think everybody slips into from time to time. We need to hear the news that there's something more, even though it's not something separate. What we're, what we're immersed in, our conventional world, the world of self and other, the world of getting and losing, is an illusion. 
It's a persistent and unconscious habit of mind, really baked in. And it's a prescription for suffering. <clears throat> Buddha diagnosed the human condition with the Four Noble Truths. Life is suffering. Life is unsatisfactory, unreliable. And the reason, second noble truth, is because of our egoistic desires, because of our grasping and rejecting. Third noble truth, of course, is that there is a way out. And the fourth is just an elucidation, the Eightfold Path, which ends with <clears throat> the seventh and the eighth, mindfulness and concentration, or dhyana, Sanskrit word for absorption, which is the uh, word that was trans, which, which was uh, pronounced as chan or zen. <clears throat> we are the absorption school of Buddhism. But just as we need words, um, there are many other aspects of, of actual Zen practice which we could call the leaves and branches. There are things that we do that are helpful, at least for most people. Um, chanting is one of them. <clears throat> Bowing is helpful. All things that help us forget ourselves and lower the mast of ego. <clears throat> In almost all Zen centers, you'll see these. Not in every one, not in all. You know, when uh, um, Tony Packer uh, was actually uh, Roshi Kaplow's first Dharma successor, and he turned the center over to her, and uh, she was so uncomfortable, <clears throat> probably due to her background, uh, so uncomfortable with the trappings of Zen that uh, she basically started to cut them all back and ran into a tremendous resistance from the people who, who were very attached to them. And the center actually ended up splitting. And Tony went off, a lot of people know this, but maybe not everyone, uh, Tony went off and established her own center. Um, and many people went with Tony and other people stayed here. And then eventually Bowdoin Roshi became the abbot of the of the center in 1986. And uh, as far as I can tell, the relationship between Roshi Kaplow and, and Tony Packer remained a warm one, a friendly one, but their ways of teaching were just too different. And uh, <clears throat> whether one is better than the other is really hard to say. It, it kind of depends on the person. I've found over the years that a lot of these uh, yeah, auxiliary practices are really helpful. And I see that in other people too, that uh, a lot of people are really uh, fond of it. It's a, it's a reaffirmation, it's a way of bringing practice into the body, of manifesting it physically, getting from the mat into our lives. But there's always there's always a bit of resistance, and and you know I'm I'm a little bit a poster child for that. Uh, I avoided a lot of the more ceremonial aspects of life at the Zen Center for quite a number of years. Um, but really, the uh, the real poster child is my wife, who uh, was extremely troubled by uh, all the devotional activities because she had come out of a. a a Baptist upbringing and sort of seen into the hypocrisy and limitations of the Baptist church that she was a part of. And uh, when, when Roshi Kaplow uh, wrote the book Zen, Dawn in the West, or yeah, Zen, Dawn in the West, I think, and then it became later uh, reissued as Zen, Merging of East and West, uh, he asked her to write up um, 
her objections. I'm going to read that. <laughs> I'm sort of blowing her anonymity. I have, uh, I have gotten her permission to do this. Um, so I found the book, uh, and uh, this section is called A Letter and a Reply, Religious Zen, It Turns Me Off. <clears throat> and this is the, ro the letter that, uh, that Chris wrote at, at Roshi Kaplow's request. It says, Dear Roshi, this letter is the result of months of stewing about a problem that I had assumed would disappear on its own or that I could resolve somehow, but nothing seems to be happening, so I'm writing in hopes that you can shed some light on the subject. Basically, my problem is this. The whole religious aspect of Zen turns me off. I don't see what Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, the heavens and hells of Buddhist cosmology, the six realms of existence, and all the other flowery con conceptions of the sutras have to do with the pure and simple task of finding out who I am. Zen appealed to me in the first place because it is so simple and direct, cutting through abstractions and fantasy for a clear view of the truth. No baloney, just zazen. But since I've been at the center, there have been more and more ceremonies and chants, and I just can't get used to them. The whole time I am participating in a ceremony or chanting, it is very difficult to continue to do zazen. I feel as if I am in a movie about some exotic religious cult. I think a lot of other people feel this way too, and this gives our ceremonies a kind of stilted, self-conscious feeling. <clears throat> um, this was at a time when a lot of the ceremonies uh, were being developed. You know, when I came to the Zen Center back in 1968, I can't remember that there was very much, even in the way of chanting. It was, it was basically sitting in Taisho. <clears throat> Um, and then gradually I remember the first time I, I hadn't been at the center for a while and I came by and there was the Hungry Ghost offering happening at lunch. Uh, a lot of those things were brought in and so it took a while for some of those to really get into the fabric of life at the center and there was a self-conscious tone to a lot of what we did. And that self-consciousness can still arise in someone who's uh, coming to some of these practices for the first time. She says, bowing and prostrating before the Buddha in the Zendo also throws me. It is meaningful for me to bow to you, my teacher, for whom I feel a deep respect and gratitude. It is also wonderful to be able to bow after each round of sitting to fellow, fellow members of the Sangha whose Zazen helps sustain mine. But I feel no direct, immediate relationship with the gilded statue on the altar, no sense of oneness like I feel with you in the Sangha. The plate of cakes and fruit in the front of the Buddha always make me want to burst out laughing. Who eats them anyway? If we're all Buddhas, why not just pass them around the Zendo? Not a bad idea. <clears throat> if everything is Buddha, why not simply bow to each other or to a beautiful flower instead of a sat statue that inevitably arousing, arouses feelings of idol worship? <clears throat> you know, this was an obstacle for Roshi Kaplow when he went to Zip Japan as well. And... Uh, I think uh, one of his teachers told him, uh, he, he, Roshi Kaplow said uh, ancient masters used to would spit on the Buddha. And uh, I think it was hard. Roshi said, if you want to spit, you spit. I prefer to bow. Uh, actually, I've never had a problem personally with, with prostrating before a Buddha figure just because it's so inspiring. The, uh, just to see that posture, that state of mind made physical, uh, it, it's like, it, it, I think it triggers mirror neurons in, our, in us. We sort of feel that, that lightness and serenity, equanimity, uh, compassion. Uh, it's, it's, it's <clears throat> you're, you're looking at a great work of art, really. Um, but it is true, for some people it's a problem. Usually it goes away, <clears throat> but for some people it may never completely recede. And so you're left with the, the problem of what do I do if uh, some of these practices just don't feel quite right to me? Um, 
yeah, there's no easy answer to that. It's, a, it's kind of a, the whole question of how much ritual and, and uh, devotional activities we have at the center is really a question of the greatest good for the greatest number. And uh, my hope is that even if it isn't something that speaks to you now in your practice, you can recognize that it is supportive for your fellow practitioners, for others. It's not, it's not just foolishness or play acting or uh, self-indulgence. It's really a way of expressing our gratitude for this path. And even if you only go with Zen, if you go deeply, you'll find gratitude arises. She says uh, <clears throat> towards the end of her, her letter, a friend of mine once remarked that the appealing thing about Zen Buddhism is that you can just take the Zen without the Buddhism. <clears throat> I asked her about this, and this was actually me. <laughs> she said, here at the center, at least, this isn't so. Why is religious Zen necessary, and how can I stop viewing it as a distraction and a nuisance and use it to find out who I am? Love, Carol. <laughs> so until today, she was anonymous. Roshi Kaplow, it's hard to answer that question. It really is a question of the individual. And uh, in Roshi's answer, he mentions how inspiring, you know, some of the practices are, the, uh, the atmosphere on temple night when everybody's sitting in a, in a, up in the Buddha hall with the large altar and the other altars that are set up. Um, I was explaining to Chris on the way here that Actually, Temple Night has changed quite a bit than from what, uh, what it was in the beginning. Um, and the main thing that people do is just to sit. It's like, it's like Yaza in the most beautiful environment you could think of, Yaza or late night sitting. <clears throat> but in the end, each person sort of has to work it out for themselves. And a lot of times what happens is you start out like I did, uh, or like Roshi Kaplow did, uh, and you find that actually you grow into it, that something that you feel can be expressed in those ways. And uh, some things, there are, there are parts that still feel a little weird, and then, well, that's okay. Um, Chris told me a story of one of the ceremonies that had been, uh, we don't do it anymore, but it involved everybody in the Zendo doing a circumambulation and coming up to the teacher who was standing facing the altar with a candle, and you would have your own candle, and when you came up, he would light your candle. <clears throat> and uh, this was a little difficult for her, and so as she did it, she looked up at Roshi Kaplow, and he met her gaze and shrugged. <laughs> <laughs> Which was the perfect response for her, and I think it helped her, <clears throat> helped her feel okay. So I really haven't answered that question very well, but I just wanted to sort of bring it out in the open because I think a lot of people feel like, uh, I don't quite mesh with this. Does that mean I really should go somewhere else? And my answer is no. I mean, if you feel you need to go somewhere else, then sure. And there are other places, but it's, it's hard to find a sangha. Uh, hard to find a sangha as healthy as this one, in my, in my humble yet prejudiced opinion. <laughs> what is always part of practice, <clears throat> whether you want to call it religious or not, is faith. Even if that faith is just the willingness to do the experiment, to go beyond thought and see what's there, what happens when we step out of the stream of concepts and ideas. It's scary. It can be frightening for the mind to fall silent. And yet that truly is the path to what we're aiming for. 
Ramana Maharshi said, when there are thoughts, it is distraction. When there are no thoughts, it is meditation. So this whole question of this faith, the faith to, to practice, I, have, uh, I, I ran across something in Roshi's files that I think is really, really helpful. And it's an interview uh, with Norman Fisher, who's a, a Zen teacher uh, connected, I believe, with the San Francisco Zen Center, and Sharon Salzberg, uh, who's another Dharma practitioner. And I just uh, want to read a little bit from the interview because uh, the, the title of the article is The Question of Faith in a Non-Theistic Religion. And uh, the, uh, the interview was uh, a follow-up to a book that uh, she had written, Faith, colon, Trusting Your Own Deepest Experience. So Norman Fisher says, in your book, you talk about the progression from bright faith to verified faith to unwavering faith. I want to ask you how faith arises and how one kind of faith unfolds into another. <clears throat> and she says, many Dharma students can recall that period of bright faith, which is at first an intoxicating rush of falling in love. Falling in love with a teacher or a teaching or falling in love with a brand new sense of possibility which we previously when we previously felt confined or unworthy and this this is sort of the um, that that excitement of coming into practice and realizing how much is here uh, i also experienced it when i uh, when i went into aa back in 1990 um, they actually have a term for it there. It's called the pink cloud. And uh, it usually doesn't last. You need to move beyond that giddy joy in the beginning to something more settled and rooted. But it, it, it is wonderful. And it is a place where many people start. Other people sort of don't even know why they're doing it. Um, somehow or other, they're drawn to the practice. And uh, some people are pulled kicking and screaming into deep realization. Uh, just all depends on the person. But as she said, this initial bright faith is incredibly exhilarating and wondrous. It's a first step. She says, this state has some similarities to blind faith, and if you're a skeptical type, you could view them as the same. Blind faith has that same kind of exhilaration and feeling of having a much larger sense of possibility, but blind faith implies that you can't question, you can't examine, you can't investigate. Blind faith is the end of the road, while in Buddhist teaching, bright faith is just the beginning. It's necessary and compelling, but it's still just a start. Through questioning, putting things into practice and examining them, Bright faith moves to the next stage, verified faith, which relies less on external sources and more on our own experience. <clears throat> verified faith comes from our own experience of the truth. The movement from bright faith to verified faith happens through putting something into practice and not just believing what we're told. It's about not being gullible, about questioning everything, what is frightening about blind faith, then, is that there is no maturing into verified faith. That questioning part goes right back to the Buddha, who told his listeners, don't accept anything just because I say so, or because your whatever teacher tells you it's true. You need to test it like you would test uh, currency, like a gold coin. Bite it, scrape it, cut it. Find out if it's really gold. It is true that we can bring blind faith into Zen practice. Uh, we can imagine, uh, have ideas about what reality is, have some kind of intellectual understanding, and make that a thing. 
we can we can take the attitude that well other people are more realized than I am um, whatever they say I'm just going to have to accept we can we can lose sight of our own potential <clears throat> don't do that don't do that believe in yourself give yourself a chance have faith in yourself, faith in the practice. <clears throat> and some people, the, the obstacle is just they're too habitually addicted to their own critical mind. They see the faults in others, they see the faults in themselves. A lot of progress in Zen practice is just that softening. But back to... Uh, back to Norman and Sharon, says, how does verified faith move to unwavering faith? And she says, through constant deepening. It's like something seeping into your bones. If you've seen the power of love enough, for example, then you know it so deeply that it's, some, that it's become something that you don't need to refer to externally. You know it so very deeply. <clears throat> Norman says, Norman Fisher says, usually when people talk about faith, as you say in the book, it's faith in something, faith in something outside of yourself. Buddhism proposes faith not in something outside of yourself, but faith in reality and your own capacity to embrace it. That's the most important point. And none of us have that totally at the beginning. Remember when I first met with Roshi Kaplow, he asked me what my aspiration was, and I said, I, I, I want to come to awakening. <clears throat> and then I immediately said, but maybe I'm just kidding myself. I don't recall that he said, oh, no, no, John, you're not. He just let that sit. Uh, gradually we realize, yeah, I can go this way. That's when blind faith bright faith, whatever it is, begins to become verified faith. We begin to see the difference in our interactions, our ability to hold things more lightly. Enlightenment in the sense of just being lighter, not carrying around this burden of self, not carrying it quite so heavily. Norman Fisher asks, can you say something about the interplay between faith in oneself and faith in another, whether that's in the form of a teacher, a transcendent God, or something else altogether? And she says, Sharon says, I often think of Buddhism as being like a transparency. We look at the Buddha as a human being who exemplified boundless love and infinite wisdom. But when we look at the Buddha to see ourselves, but we really look at the Buddha to see ourselves, because we're looking at a potential that exists within us. And we also look at ourselves, not just to see ourselves, but to see all beings. And she goes on to say that all of her teachers <clears throat> had the goal of seeing the students surpass them. The job of the teacher is really to be a friend, someone who helps you and not an authority. To be very careful because a uh, teacher can uh, say, I'm, you know, I'm no different from you, you're no different from me, but the student will come in with their own ideas and sometimes the teacher has some of those ideas too. It's very hard in a relationship, a student-teacher relationship, not to have a power dynamic. Uh, and the teacher supposedly has the answers. The student is coming for help. <clears throat> it's far more um, common in other traditions, in the whole uh, guru to tradition, where the teacher is looked on as a manifestation of the Buddha. Uh, and in, a, in our tradition, we still have... Uh, if someone's a formal student of the teacher, there's a prostration 
<clears throat> that's made in Doksan at the beginning of the private instruction with the, with the teacher. But that prostration is in, to the teaching, really, to the teacher as a representative of the teaching. And most people, including <clears throat> Carol, <laughs> I have no problem with that if there is some respect there. Norman Fisher says, it can be tricky because one could think that faith that is not in something or someone is really just self-confidence. You seem to be saying, though, that it's not that you're confident in yourself, but that you see through yourself to something greater. In a way, faith in self and faith in other might in the end collapse into the same thing. And Sharon Salzberg says, I think they would have to. Whether you're starting with the other or you're starting with yourself, ultimately it has to be about everybody. This truth is beyond self and other. And then he gets into something that I really want to cover, <clears throat> so I'll move right along. Um, he says, you take great care in the book to distinguish faith from belief and you also talk about the relationship between faith and hope. Can you say more, say a bit more about these important distinctions? And she brings up here the, the Brahma Viharas. These are the so-called divine abodes, uh, loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. And she says in, this, in the teaching of the Brahma Viharas, each one of these has qualities that are, each one of these qualities has a near and a far enemy. So as an example, she gives uh, <clears throat> the example of loving kindness or metta and says the near enemy of metta is, of our loving kindness is attachment. The far enemy is cruelty. So you can sort of understand that the near enemy is something that's close but not quite there. Um, and with faith, she goes on to say, the near enemy of faith is belief, is taking something, some teaching or statement as true without finding out for oneself. <clears throat> And then hope is even more of a problem. Hope in this case, she says, means a kind of fixated hope. It's like when we say, I have faith that everything will turn out all right tomorrow, which means according to the way we want it to turn out. That isn't faith at all. That is fixated hope, where we're dependent, attached, and full of fear. We can't have that kind of fixation without the accompanying fear that the hope will happen, that what we hope will happen might not happen. Think, of course, about uh, the poem by T.S. Eliot. You have heard this before. I said to my soul, be still and wait without hope, for hope would be hope for the wrong thing. Wait without love, for love would be love of the wrong thing. There is yet faith, but the faith and the love and the hope are all in the waiting. Wait without thought, for you're not ready for thought. So the darkness shall be the light and the stillness the dancing. It's the faith to find out, the faith to look. So what's wonderful <clears throat> about Zen practice and really about, about true Buddhism It's a way of finding out the truth. It's not a belief, it's a practice. <clears throat> it 
you've looked at the home page of the website, you'll see that's right there at the top. <clears throat> There's a koan where the teacher says to the student, ask the student, um, where have you come from on pilgrimage? What are you looking for? I don't know. The teacher says, not knowing is most intimate. Roshi Kaplow used to say, to go I know not where, by a road I know not of. We practice in the dark. As T.S. Eliot says, the darkness shall become light and the stillness dancing. <clears throat> all of us need all the help we can get. And that's what the center is for. Help people work on themselves <clears throat> and be of benefit to the whole world, be of benefit to life. <clears throat> we'll stop now and recite the four vows. <clears throat> 